Sometimes I get so afraid Of this made up world I made But when I trust inside There's no need to hide my I have suffered far too long Thinking I can know for myself what's right and what's wrong But now I'm learning to laugh At all those games I played in the past And it's calling me home I'm giving up believing that I really know anything at all I'm forgiving myself for being afraid of running away I'm living by the rhythm of the soul And I trust I will be sure which way to go, which way to flow, which way to know who I am and who I've always been. There's a secret in your heart that can tell you. If I forgive you, then I may know that secret too. Cause now I'm living by the rhythm of the soul, and it's calling me home. I'm giving up believing that I really know anything at all. I'm for Living by the rhythm of the soul And I trust I will be shown Which way to go Which way to flow Which way to know Who I am And who I've always been well, It can be so easy I stop making it so hard When I just trust the river It gently carries me along To the sound of my favorite song If you sometimes feel afraid Of this made-up world we made You can trust inside And you know everything's okay now we're living by the rhythm of the soul And it's calling us home We're giving up believing that we've ever known anything at all Forgiving ourselves for being afraid and running away We're living by the rhythm of the soul And we're on
more song for him before David gives the talk. <clears throat> My name's Eric, by the way. Hey, Eric. Hey, Eric. And uh, Tamara and I are about to go on a little tour around the U.S. and just see where we're guided to go. And a few years ago, or two years ago, I think, she wrote this beautiful song called I Got You, which was um, just all about letting go and trusting the Holy Spirit will take care of all the details. And so, uh, yeah, let's sing that one for you. <laughs> of your tour. I guess it's already launched, but we're, we're at the Bon Voyage phase there. And Jenny uh, and Greg are here, they've spoken earlier, they're touring, so oh, I just love coming out to the Bay Area. I love it out here. I 
love the, the vibe and the depth and the presence and, and uh, it's one of those kind of meccas of those who have such a sincere desire to awaken and to come to a, a true connection with Source and to live it, to actually live it. So, for me this uh, experience of, of what people have called the spiritual journey has gone on for decades and, and uh, with a lot of devotion and trust then I think the fruits of the Spirit really start shining through and that's just basically your peace of mind and happiness, joy, really consistently. So I, I say I haven't really had a bad day for 30 30 years, I think it's been, maybe 20, 30 years since I, I lost track. But it's been a long time since I had a bad day, and it's because it's, it's from the dedication and the devotion and living really an inspired life. And I think all of us know that that's like the key to spiritual awakening, is inspiration. We have this inspiration, this light in us, and sometimes it seems like it's quite covered over in awareness, but when it starts to burst forth, then we we really feel like we're we're in our true calling. And once we've gotten into our calling, we're really in the detractor beam, we might say, uh, of, of awakening. And it gets very involuntary. Come on in, we're just starting. <laughs> got some, we've got seats here. Yeah. So, then I talk a bit about non-duality and hopefully for some of you bringing some, some new aspects because I think the, the teachings that take us into this non-dual experience, there are traditional means that have served well for many, many generations uh, and those are often known as uh, meditation and inquiry, there are um, different breathing techniques, different movement techniques, there's uh, contemplation, there's a pathway of, of prayer, of centering prayer, there's just so many aspects and hopefully tonight myself and others that will join me on the panel up here will be able to introduce some, some new ones. Uh, to go along with the traditional ones, because I think everybody is aware that, that we would hope to have that experience consistently, and in the time sense, we would like to save time. If there's something that could help seem to accelerate us into the experience of a consistent peace of mind and a consistent joy, then that would be of interest to us in spiritual awakening. And also, I will talk about some terms that are tossed around in many non-dualistic traditions. I'm familiar with quite a few traditions and I know that the terminology can be different and for those who are on a non-dual path sometimes, when you're going through it and you're listening to one teacher and he's using a certain word, maybe like consciousness or awareness uh, or forgiveness or whatever the, the words are, that with different traditions and different teachers there are different meanings. Uh, some teachers um, would, would say something like, thought is a problem. Uh, or other traditions might say, you, know, you need to learn to get out of your mind. Uh, and then some traditions are uh, teaching you that you are mind, holy mind, purely mind, and nothing but mind, and that you need to purify that mind, because if it's a split mind and it serves two masters, as Jesus talked about, then there's a difficulty with trying to ride two horses like love and fear. Uh, they don't really go together very well, it's like trying to mix oil and water. So. Um, even in terms of uh, those kind of teachings, I can tell you a bit, uh, having worked with A Course in Miracles for 33 years, uh, and the Course is from Jesus, and so it's, it's got a, I mean in some cases he's loose with the words a little bit, 
but in many cases he will take terminology that we're familiar with from the non-dual traditions and he will uh, give us a pretty precise definition and then when you watch the whole symphony together you go, oh my gosh, this is absolutely amazing, this is extraordinary. And I can give you an example, um, a term that's often spoke about in a lot of non-dualistic traditions is consciousness. And the first time I came to the Course, I studied a lot of traditions, but I, I had to really look where Jesus was defining consciousness. He says, consciousness is the domain of the ego. Whew. That's interesting. I've heard a lot of different traditions, but I've never heard that definition. And so when it's Jesus Christ telling me consciousness is the domain of the ego, uh, that it's, it's, um, it's variable, uh, it receives messages, it's kind of a receptive mechanism, consciousness is, and it receives messages from above, the higher self, or the intuition, and, and below the subconscious or the ego. And so it's like, hmm, fascinating. So consciousness is, is not like it's sometimes described as, uh, in quantum physics, I, you know, they'll, they'll say consciousness is the ground of all being. Jesus wouldn't say that. He says, no, it's the domain of the ego. The good news about consciousness is that it can be trained. And anybody who's into any spiritual discipline, it doesn't matter which one knows, and it involves a lot of discipline and mind training. Uh, whether you're watching a movie like The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, you know, with uh, Dan and Socrates, and you know there's a lot of mind training that goes on there. It's pretty, pretty sharp and pretty steep. In some traditions, the teacher-student relationship is quite uh, intense, like in that movie. And there's a training that's going on, and I would say it's actually a purification, so that what you're doing is you're training your consciousness to, to receive from what is, we'll say, above, or just a metaphor, but uh, from Spirit. Uh, to receive your guidance and your messages from Spirit, more and more consistently from the Spirit than from the ego. So that, that training is absolutely essential. There's a very much of a discipline. And it's important to realize that that, that can't be skipped over. And of course, whether we talk about self-inquiry, or meditation, or contemplation, or whatever, you're still... It, it's just good to know that, that consciousness is something that you're going to have to focus your mind training on, your effort towards that. Being this, Spirit doesn't need to be trained. Uh, I am this pure beingness. There is no mind training involved in that. Uh, that's just a state of being perfectly awake. But even that is defined by Jesus as, as light. It's abstract. It's, uh, it doesn't have any thought forms. Beingness does not have any thought forms. So when we're dealing with consciousness, we're dealing with thought forms all the time. One of the workbook lessons is, my thoughts are images I have made. So, thought forms are these very specific thoughts that involve linear time, and that block the awareness of spirit, or pure being. And that's where the, that's like the crucible. Consciousness is our crucible for awakening. Whichever pathway you take, whichever way you train your mind, you're working in the realm of consciousness. Consciousness also, since it's thought forms, it involves symbols, and um, with meditation you want to sink deep within your mind, and sink deeper and deeper, and it seems like an emptying of consciousness. And I would say that's pretty accurate as well, that as you tune in more and more to the spirit, and, and less and less to the ego, it's like your mind seems to empty. Emptying the contents of consciousness is what it's been called in many traditions. And that's, that's a beautiful pathway as well. I think with the Course in Miracles, what it does is, it's, it's a mind training program that's designed to be used almost anywhere, in any time or place, and so it's not 
very specific in terms of the behaviors or in terms of the environments. Like many pathways to God, they would say, remove yourself from distractions, um, uh, try to sometimes step away from uh, the world and the busyness of the world and, and try to do that. And that can be a helpful symbol and stepping stone, although I think all of us know that if, you know, we can say your mind goes with you wherever you go. So if you've got the monkey mind going, um, whether you're sitting in a cave with uh, Ramana's cave over Arunachala, or whether you're back on Market Street in San Francisco, uh, you still have your consciousness to deal with. You still have those thoughts to deal with. And it, it's still a call for, for training, for stilling the mind. Some of the things that I've found from using the Course is that basically much of the, the workbook lessons of the Course in Miracles are like doing a, a Zen open-eyed meditation along with instruction uh, as you move through the day. So you have one central thought. It could be, I have, there is nothing to fear, which is workbook lesson 48, where you take one lesson and you carry it like a torch through the day and you go through your activities of the day, with your eyes open. Occasionally you may be instructed to, to take time out, to close your eyes, uh, and at times to sink inward. Uh, there's very, very specific instructions that come along with the workbook of A Course in Miracles. But overall the context, it's quite fun because you don't have to have a lot of special circumstances or uh, special situations, so you're not trying to orchestrate situations, you, you can pretty much go with it and transfer that training with whatever you are perceiving. So in that sense it's, it's uh, very open and very flexible. I think it's very useful in terms of a practical application for training your mind. They're very powerful lessons of undoing your self-concept, of dropping the mask, of undoing your entire distorted perception of the world, to clear the consciousness out in the most rapid way possible. Uh, along the way, of course, there's aspects of self-inquiry in there because you are really watching and observing and you're, you're aware that this whole mind training experience that may go on for for weeks or months or years or decades, always revolves around identity. That the core of spiritual awakening is like the Greeks said, know thyself, know who you are. And all of the great traditions have said you need to realize the self, you need to actualize the self, realize the self. And this pathway, it always has the undercurrent of, of like uh, the movie The Lion King, where the voice from the sky says, Remember, the James Earl Jones, remember, Simba, remember, like remember who you are. That's, that's the undercurrent, that's, that's the focal point of everything, every single spiritual practice, every ounce of energy, and every speck of devotion goes towards that remembrance. And for myself it was making contact with guidance. Uh, that's, that's an interesting uh, concept as well because there are some non-dual pathways to source and to, to self that, that can really have you watch your thoughts, inquire about who is the I, like with Ramana's pathway, but but I'm going to present to you uh, kind of a map of the mind, a map of consciousness that may serve you in this uh, spiritual awakening, uh, because it has different nuances and different aspects to it, and, and yet I found it very relatable, having come through undergrad and grad with, with psychology background, and uh, the Course uses psychology terms, Christian terminology, and uh, educational terminology, but I was most fascinated with, the, with consciousness. I, I was like, okay, Jesus, please instruct me 
on what's actually seeming to happen in my mind, so I can use what you're going to teach me as a tool to, to clear my mind in a faster way. That's basically what it was for me. Uh, Jenny and Greg spoke earlier, they were talking about perception. And perception might be equated with consciousness as well. That um, when you look at the world, this perceptual world of time and space and images and and uh, sights and sounds and colors and shapes, this perceptual world is, is you could say, a, a motion picture of consciousness. So, if you know that consciousness is the domain of the ego, and you're looking at the world, you're looking at a motion picture of consciousness. A motion picture of the ego. The ego has projected this linear world, this cosmos of time and space. Interesting, different from what I was raised with in Christianity. Uh, God created the heavens and the earth, uh, and talked about <laughs> resting on the seventh day, and then it's like, wait a minute, you're telling me that God is the creator of the heavens, and spirit, and love, and light, and ego projected time and space. Hmm, okay. That's an interesting metaphysical distinction off the bat. But that's also why consciousness is the domain of the ego, because of all the levels and all of the different distortions. Uh, everything, um, you might even say even in science, uh, some of you who are familiar with science know the, the concept of entropy. That uh, that everything in the cosmos is like moving toward destruction, is what, what entropy is. And it's no wonder, because the ego is the sponsor, and the ego is behind it. You wouldn't have, it would be strange if God created the cosmos, and then somehow, suddenly there's entropy. Uh, oh, shucks, what went wrong? It, it, was, it said in the Bible that, Every, God created, and then everything God looked on was good. Entropy doesn't really fit in well with the good part, you know. The scientists are saying it's destruction. But from a sense that the ego projected it, then it's like, oh, entropy fits right in there. Like, well, of course. A death wish, like the ego, a substitute identity for what is real and true, uh, oh, that's what produces destruction. Okay, that makes sense. And so you might say that the purification of consciousness is to disidentify from the false, or the ego, disidentify from the death wish, and identify with the source. The love, the light, the, the abstraction, the joy, the happiness, you know, that's the whole point of spiritual awakening, is to know thyself and identify with what is real and true. So the Course, I find, has been a very, very helpful mind training tool, mind training device. And then I found in my life, as I got happier and happier and happier, and really consistently happy and joyful, then they always say, like attracts like, so I started to have people wanting to live with me, move in near me, move in down the street. It's like, it's like it draws forth the witnesses. Happiness draws forth witnesses of itself. A happy state of mind draws forth happy witnesses, happy people, happy dogs, happy cats, happy butterflies, bees, everything, you know. Uh, even flies. One time I, <laughs> I, I was down in Australia uh, with my friend Kirsten and we were, I was in the chair and she was over on the couch and we were meditating and uh, this fly got into the room and the fly kept buzzing buzzing her, buzzing around her head and everything, and zooming around and everything, and I could see, I looked over, I could see her eye, and she was eyeing the fly. And this went on for like five minutes, and finally there was a piece of paper there, and she just rolled it up into like a fly swatter, uh, to like club the fly. And then the fly flew across over to where I was sitting, and just sat right here, and then turned and looked at me. Like, <laughs> Do you believe that? She, she, 
meditating with what happened to the to peace and love and joy for all sentient beings that are right there. Like, I'm, just like, I'm sharing the space here. I'm, doing, I'm just fanning her and keeping her cool. And, she, and so, and she saw it too. She looked over at me and then she looked over and she was eye to eye with the, the fly. And the fly was turned just looking at her. And, but it's all just symbols. Everything in time and space is just a motion picture of our mind. So it's just a symbol of what's going on in the mind. And even if it's a little bit of irritation or annoyance, that's still coming from the ego. It's not coming from the source. So we're here for a purification. When I use the Course, and I, I really like let it kind of really clean out my mind and empty self-concepts and identifications and suck the pride out of the mind and <laughs> suck the arrogance out and and there was a lot to suck out of it, really, actually. Because I've been 10 years at university, undergrad and grad school, so it was, there was a lot of monkey mind going on there, and a lot of need for emptiness in a, in a huge way. And so, as I got into that, then the more I, I got into just being, like Eric was just saying, the rhythm of the soul, the more I got into the rhythm of the soul and in alignment and congruent with with love and light and spirit, then the fruits of the spirit would come through in all kinds of ways. I would be doing gatherings around the United States and then around Canada, then I was doing world tours and zipping around to, on six different continents and just being used to basically be, you could say almost like a, a channel, a channel of spirit in terms of the words and the demonstration of spirit, in terms of the lightness, the humor, the laughter, all the things that you would expect to be the fruits of the spirit, kind of pouring through me, and going to all these different countries, and, and just shining, and sharing, and hugging, and laughing, and using all kinds of examples, and metaphors, and teaching metaphysics, but also teaching practical application of those metaphysics. And so, there was a lot of that going on, and it was a huge amount of travel that went on for quite a few years. And then also things started to come where uh, Spirit was using music more and more uh, in my, my gatherings, satsangs, in different types of presentations. Just in my daily life, I, I was just surrounded by amazing music. And then uh, when I would travel, I would have amazing musicians who would show up, and like Eric, we heard tonight, uh, as an example, where we, those things would just be given almost like props for sharing the love and the light. And then I, when I went to countries where I didn't speak the language, then translators would show up. The first time I went to Argentina, a close friend of mine had said, you are going to have a big problem in Argentina. And I said, what is the big problem? And she said, yeah, you speak English and they speak Spanish and that's a big problem. But when I got down there for like two weeks, there was about 14 amazing translators that were just sent in. Just like the singer-songwriters, the Spirit sent translators in and everything that I would seem to need was given. I also started using Hollywood movies because Jesus taught in parables, so I thought, well, parable, Hollywood movies are like modern day parables. They're, they're, I don't have to come up with, there was a man who had two sons and all that old stuff, it's already been done. And then I thought, I, I don't know if I can come up with it. Jesus, all these parables, and you know, there's plenty of parables. Hollywood keeps cranking them out. Hollywood, Bollywood, no shortage of parables. There's plenty of parables. So I started to show movies, and I remember I was teaching down in Cali, Colombia, and I was down in this huge building in, in this large city of Cali, and people would tell me, why don't you show The Matrix, or there was that movie, a quantum physics movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? And so, for most of the major Hollywood movies, it was no problem getting the Spanish 
translation, you know, the subtitles and everything. With What the Bleep, I had brought uh, the, the producer of What the Bleep had uh, been on a talk show that I was on here in California and down in Santa Barbara, and so I got an advanced copy. But I took it down to Columbia and I thought, I'll show this quantum physics movie, they'll love that. But oh, it doesn't have Spanish subtitles, it was an advanced copy. So uh, I got another copy and I went to the theater to show it, I announced the movie and it wouldn't play. It wouldn't play and I was like, hmm. So the spirit just prompted me, does anybody in the audience here have to have a spare copy of What the Bleep Do We Know? As I'm down in Colony, Columbia, and there a hand goes up. <laughs> Somebody had just bought it at the store and it was still in the bag. And it was good. I got it! <laughs> wow. That's what I mean, the spirit will, it's just all symbols, so the world will say, that's the synchronicity. Well, you know, it just happens that way. Whatever you seem to need. And, when I first went to Columbia too, I remember using The Matrix, The Matrix movie, and I just would uh, work with a friend I was staying with and I would tell him where to pause the DVD. You know, nowadays, you know, there's lots of more higher tech stuff. But this is back, you know, this, is, this is dating me, but this is back in the day of DVDs, as they say in Australia, day by days, day by days. You, so I'd say, pause it at this point, this point, this point, this point, and I would do teachings uh, that would pour through me from the Spirit, pausing the movie. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. Because people were receptive, I mean, I showed, uh, um, I think, Eternal Sunshine, The Spotless Mind, and I, I demystified relationships. I took all of the the complexities the ego projects onto human relationships and I, I lifted all of them off using Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind with Kate Winslet and, uh, and then I could see young couples in the audience that were just kind of looking at each other during and after the movie like Oh, our, our relationship is never going to be the same. <laughs> because when you start to demystify and, and expose the ego dynamics and the mirroring that goes on and, and how helpful the mirroring can be if, you're, if you use it in a helpful way. You don't get caught in the predictions. You actually look closer inside to see what is it that I believe. What are the thoughts that are making the projection? And then you can let them go. So, the young couples were like, they looked like they were, it was Valentine's Day, a, a metaphysical Valentine's Day, because there was so much freedom that came just from starting to understand what's going on in consciousness underneath the surface. As long as I'm interpreting the behaviors, I'm, I'm stuck in the egoic interpretations and I'm stuck in those stark, dark emotions. When I release it, then I'm free. And so, that started a, uh, a whole synergy. I remember one time showing Groundhog Day down in Columbia too, and going through and pausing the whole thing with Bill Murray and the, and the loop of time, and I could start to teach that there is another way, there is a way to escape the loop. And they were all fascinated by that. And just listening to them giggle and laugh. There was a teenage girl in front of me when I was showing it, and she was just laughing and bursting and laughing and crying and healing through the whole movie. And I could just feel it. I thought, what a wonderful use of time and space to use it for healing. Instead of using it to stay stuck in time, use it to release yourself from time and the repetition of the ego's repetition of time. Because the ego invented linear time to keep the mind guilty. And so my mission in life has been to free the mind. And then, as it progressed, then this book came through me, The Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. Lots of tools like a, you know, like Byron Katie has like a worksheet. Uh, and of course the turning it around and the, the four questions and so forth. Spirit gave me a 12-step worksheet and 
I started using that um, with sometimes with movies, and I started blending different tools that the Spirit was giving me to rapidly peel the onion of consciousness, to rapidly clear away the unconscious, which was really my prayer. How can I go release the unconscious in a faster way to, to bring me closer to Source? And so, I started to realize too that people needed to feel safe, they needed to feel relaxed, and they really needed to, to start to feel the potential and build their confidence for this unwinding of the ego. And movies were fantastic for that, because most people when they watch a movie, they, they're there for entertainment. And they're very relaxed, and their, their mind is very open and receptive to ideas. So I could let the spirit shoot through there, and I did realize that, that um, I developed this Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. Our community grew up and we built this thing called Mystical Mind Training, which was a, an audio-visual mind training um, tool that was online. A friend of mine, Lila, used it. The, she was on the module one of, of maybe 12, 12 or 15 modules and she had a mystical experience. She was laid out on the floor uh, for some hours in a mystical experience from just working with the first module of the mystical mind training program. And I'm like, okay, we're, this is unconventional, not typical meditation and, and contemplation, but it's working. Uh, the movies, there was a woman who had been studying A Course in Miracles for 14 years and then I think I was the Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind movie with commentary that she sprung into her first ever mystical experience during the middle of the movie. And then afterwards had the tears just streaming down her face and all she could say to me was, God is real! God is real! I've been working on this book for 14 years doing the lessons and reading and practicing and one huge mystical experience in the middle of eternal sunshine and spotless mind. And I just smiled at her and I, I gave her a big hug. I said, yeah, your spiritual journey has just taken, gone off now to a new level. Because when you have a direct experience of Source, then your confidence level starts to shoot up as far as, you know, opening and really going for it. You know, it went from a grind into, God is real and I'm coming. I'm coming, I'm going to go for it. And then, um, actually, the, I started to get like a nickname after quite a few years because I was sharing so much. I would put all these talks and gatherings on the internet and start putting up, uploading videos and working on a speaker channel and putting all these audios and doing hundreds, thousands, literally, uh, probably thousands of hours of of satsangs online, and then people start to plug into that and, and go deeper into that and use all of that. And then um, I started to get this nickname, they said, David's a tech mystic. That, usually those words don't typically, historically go together, but tech mystic. And so I was like, oh yeah, I guess kind of. I, it taken a lot of surrender, because when I was in university, I, I really didn't like computers. I did all this traveling around the United States and all these spontaneous holy encounters. Before there was cell phones, I wasn't using email, wasn't using cell phones, and then years later people would come to me and say, hey, what about your email list? And I said, what email list? And they said, you're supposed to, if you travel and you meet people, you're supposed to develop like an email list. And I said, uh, why? They're like, uh, <laughs> the tech mystic who doesn't have an email list. Oh, how can we even fathom this? So I actually got into a part where the, we're working with people in our collaborations in our community. We took these, this like instrument for peace workshop and we took these levels of mind, uh, map of the mind that I mentioned earlier. Perception on the outer ring, 
then the emotions underneath the perceptions, then the thoughts, the cognition under the emotions, and then the beliefs underneath the thoughts, and then the desire, the core. It's what Jesus gave me. He gave me a map of the mind and he said, starting with the center, that's where your causation is, that's your point of power, your prayer, and everything goes out towards the projection, but it all is coming from consciousness. You know, we've all been trained in science to think that the, you know, the sound waves go in and hit the eardrum and the neurological impulses go to the brain. Now these are like your Bose speakers. These are the, this is where the sound gets generated from consciousness and through the ears. It goes this way, it doesn't go this way. And we think light comes in through the retina and the image of the earth. No, we've had it all backwards and so even our science was wrong. Our, uh, Newtonian science was, is all messed up too. It's consciousness generates everything through the, the brain, through the five senses, and these are projectors. These are not receptors of light. These are projectors of light. It's consciousness projecting what's in the mind. And this is why science, much of science, is still in the Stone Age, because much of science is still in Newtonian. You know, the, Somehow the, the world's outside of us and there's, it's an external world that can be measured and it comes in through our five senses. But I've even worked with people having experiences with out-of-body experiences, uh, near-death experiences where they, they're above their body and they're looking down at their body. And I said, tell me about it. And they say, I can see my body. I can, I can hear noises in the room. Uh, you know, when I, whether it's in a coma or an out-of-body experience, and I say, very good. If you can still perceive your body from the corner of the room, and you can still hear the sounds of the breathing, and you can still smell it, then it must be what? That your five senses are not in your body. That they're part of your mind. If you can perceive, from up the top of the room, what are the little eyeballs up there? The little, little ears sticking up in the corner of the room? No. Oh, there's a great insight. The five senses are not part of the body. Whew. Big spiritual awareness, you know. Using examples, teaching people the power of their mind, the power of consciousness, and learn how to train it, and develop it, and discipline it, and align it with spirit. That's, that's what this is all really about. And so then these five, um, actually twelve different steps were put into, of all things, a Facebook bot. That's right. <laughs> I want to add another tool to your spiritual awakening, a Facebook bot where you go in and the bot basically says, how are you feeling? And you write into the bot, you send a message to the bot and you tell it how you're feeling. If you're upset, this bot will work with you and will do the inquiry for you. It will start with where you're feeling and what you're perceiving. And it's a bot that's designed and built on these levels of mind that I talk about and also built on this, um, these steps, but it's put in an interactive bot. So you start the bot by telling it how, how you feel, what you're going through, and then it takes you down, down, down in your mind to release what you're holding on to in your subconscious mind. Well, wow, that's kind of interesting. A Facebook bot, no one never thought of my spiritual awakening journey involving that. And some of you know the iPhone, uh, you know, you can use its, its Siri on the iPhone, so this spot is named Spiri. So Spiri is designed to help you go through more unconscious darkness, get in touch with your unconscious beliefs that you're holding on, because when you're upset, you're really upsetting yourself. There's nothing in the world upsetting you. It's something going on in your consciousness is where the upset is. And then Spiri helps you go in and get in touch with what that is, and then, and then actually will offer you, if you get stuck at a certain point, it will, it will recommend like a video to watch, or a tool to use, 
And so it's very interactive. It's, it sometimes it, it's like a, it gives you some medicine, not in a typical way, but it gives you some tools that you may want to explore as you go down into your mind. And then finally people were saying again, like, well, yeah, but I don't, I don't always have Facebook with me and everything. Can you, can you make this into an app for my Android or for my iOS, for my iPhone? Yes, so now we have, we have an app version to download for free for your, your Android or your iOS system so you can actually just use it with your phone. Maybe you're out and you don't have an internet connection and you're, <laughs> you've got some panic happening there. You can just still go into your Spiria right there on your smartphone, whatever it is, and work. These are just examples of, of how once the mind gets clear, then the fruits of the Spirit come up with all types of interactions, collaborations, ways of getting you out of your ego comfort zone and stretching you into an expansion of your awareness, expansion of consciousness. There's actually one point in the Course in Miracles where Jesus says that the body is solely a means of communication, and then another point where he says the body is only for expanding your awareness. Wow, in a world where the body is used in so many different applications, in so many different ways, for so many things, here is the way, the truth, and the life, giving a little tip, a little pointer saying, it's to expand your perception, expand and expand your awareness. You can expand your perception. You can release the limits that you place on perception from your mind through using your body as a symbol among other symbols, but not giving it more importance or less importance than a learning device. That's important when we wake up, because the ego uses the body as, a, as an alter, alter ide identity. You know, it's, it's, you're not, if you're not spirit, the ego is like, well, here, you're a personality, and then all the guilt that comes to try to, to live with that. So, that's my gig for the night. Now, <laughs> it's 8 of 2. Why don't we have some Jenny and Greg, you and Bran and Alexandra want to come up. And, and here we will have others that are practicing A Course in Miracles uh, for some years and facing all the kind of things that all of us are facing, the human condition and all of the, the things that go with the human condition of facing things around, you know, lack, around body issues, around image issues and everything. And um, that's, to me it's kind of a treat to have a panel discussion. I love panel discussions. <laughs> and, and what's so cool is because different people have different issues and different things they're struggling with, then the Spirit can use the panel to address those in a way that are, is most helpful and most relevant. Because, uh, you know, if you, if you were going to talk about a condition of, um, of feeling isolated and, uh, and uh, alone and imprisoned, it might be good to talk to a prisoner and say, <laughs> what is your spiritual, what is your experience of the spiritual journey? I don't necessarily want to hear from the CEO in this case, I want to hear from the prisoner. And in, in our case, we just have had a range of, of many, many experiences in applying this and working through this. And so uh, we thought that would be the best way to do our Q&A tonight. So, uh, yeah, we'll just open it up. And we also, looks like there's a mic here. Is that Yes, that's, that's for the audience. That's for the audience. That's rubbing. Do we need uh, someone to... Sandari. Sandari? She's, she's full of energy. She had a trust, <laughs> her trust question was answered earlier. Now she's vibrating at a very high frequency. <laughs> so if you have any questions, comments, uh, or, um, or even 
issues or things that you're struggling with on your spiritual journey, then this is a great uh, opportunity just to why just have a, a wide, free-ranging discussion. So if anybody has anything you'd like to, to ask of any of us. Thank you. I'm Sean, I'm from Fresno. Hi guys. So I keep struggling with this thing where I keep, I feel like I get to a place of like trust and I feel like I'm about to like leap off and trust and then I engage in something in the world that makes me feel trapped. And I, and I feel like, like what do I do? Like I, I get in further debt, or I act out in a certain way, or, and then I just, it feels like I'm just kind of trapped in the darkness more, and like self sabotaging, I guess, in a way. But yet, yeah, the debt thing sometimes is like trying to grow more in the world and make the persona better, you know, because that's what the world tells us to do. But then as a chorus student, and I, I do that thinking, oh, it's going to work. And then I feel like, oh my gosh, I just like, <laughs> like trapped myself more in darkness. This is sounding like the Bedazzled movie, <laughs> where the, the devil gives you seven wishes, and, and then you do the wish and you go, no, not exactly what I was hoping for. Right. Um, but it's beautiful too. I think we can start off with that in the sense that that oftentimes um, we we can feel trapped or imprisoned or whatever by what we do, and and then it's helpful to come back to that, like, oh yeah, that's right. It's not behavior that imprisons me, even though that story the ego will use the justification, saying, well, you did this, and you did this, and what do you expect? You feel guilty because, well, look the way you acted. And you should feel guilty, the ego says, if I did that, I'd feel guilty. And, you know, that's the way it works. It's, it's so associated with behavior, the only chance that the ego has to make our mind feel guilty is to, is to point to behavior as if behavior is causative. And it is as if the behaviors cause us to feel a certain way. And even that is, is backwards, because it's all our thoughts, it's our beliefs and thoughts. And we don't even have direct control over our behavior. I know it seems like, you know, we have all these weight loss programs, stop smoking, stop this, stop that, as if we have direct control. But the Course teaches us what you do comes from what you think. And you can control your, the direction of your thinking, but you have no actual direct control at all over the, the body. It's, it's like an outpicturing, a projection, that comes from the thoughts and the beliefs. And then the ego tells us, well look what you did. You, you didn't call them back, or you didn't smile at them, or you didn't pay back the money, or, or, or you made a lot of money. But you spent it on the wrong things. You know, you see how it's always focusing on the behavior. And I, I think, when I was listening to you talk, that's the first thing that was coming to mind was like, oh, this is a loosening of the judgments around the behaviors. Because the body is just an effect, and, and when we judge the body, we are giving causation to those behaviors. That just came to me. Yeah, and I'm just fascinated at how, do I need to turn it on? No, you're on. Um, and how well people observe themselves, you know. You, you, also in the other session we had, when someone described their issue, it's like, oh wow, what a, what a great way to be able to observe your pattern, you know, and describe it. And, like that, and I, yeah, I love David's answer because, you know, we are called to not make differences or not to judge what anything means. So to just continue to do this mind training practice, like you, you probably don't see how far you've come, you know, that's what comes to me.
I think too, it's like we, we're so focused on these categories like, uh, like around the behaviors, what do I do for a living, or um, the way we spend money, you know, it's like we're, we can be very critical, <coughs> so critical around behaviors. Like that inner critic is just going on and on, revving on and on about certain behaviors and, and the shoulds. And the shoulds and ought tos, like, well I see this over here and that looks to me like they're happy over there. And they're happy over there and I'm not happy. And here's the behaviors and that, oh, well there, that accounts for it right there. And we make these false associations with the behaviors, whereas what we do comes from what we think. And Jesus says in the Course, uh, it is with your thoughts alone that we must work. Jesus is not big on behavior. I mean, he will still use those symbols in the workbook, like sit quietly, or, you know, he'll, he'll still address you as if you've got a body. He's not trying to jump, jump right over all of that to keep it practical. But there's not the morality that most of us have grown up with. And the morality and the ethics that are so thick, where there's such a pressure, like we feel penned in. And it reminds me, many years ago, Spike Lee did a, a movie called Do the Right Thing. And, and there's pressure with trying to live up to a standard. And we're, is it enough? Are we a good enough parent? Are we a good enough worker? Are we a good enough citizen? You know, there's pressure with that comparison. And, and really it's like we're, we're being asked to just look at the thoughts and then ask internally, you know, do these, these thoughts serve me? Are they serving me? And that's how we get out of that inner predicament. I'm sure we've all had experiences too around that. Is yours, when you're talking tonight, is it, is it around more the thing of lack, like you were saying, like, is it around the thing of money or um, job, career. Job, career. So, so maybe you can share a little bit more. Like, how does it feel? Is, it, is there like a, a pressure, or do you feel you, yourself criticizing yourself around certain things? Yes. The job I am in now, I always feel like I'm too slow. Someone hard on myself all day long. And so I'm always trying to look for a better job. But because of that belief, I never think I'm going to be good at any other job, but I'm going to be too slow. And so, so then I invest in like self improvement programs, <laughs> which I think are going to make me better somehow. And I just feel like I kind of get trapped. Like when I go back to, I get in this high anxiety place of like, I don't know how to do this. And I go back and read the Course and go to the lessons and read other spiritual texts just to feel peaceful and like calm and, you know, get the message like I'm, I'm valuing the wrong things, but then I spent all this money on the self improvement course. So then I kind of, I just, then I even end up feeling like I'm just hiding in my room because I don't know what to do. Because I feel inadequate. Yeah, I feel inadequate in the world. That's good to know, because that way you can start. It gives you a bit of an inroad, like oh, of of what my issue is. If if I'm inadequate, or I'm judging myself as slow, or there's a pressure to improve, or to to speed up in some way, and it feels like it's like then you want to isolate or, or hide, then that's good. You start to get an inroad into to the issue. I would say too, it's just this core issue of like lack that's in there. And, and there's an unworthiness tied in very strongly with that lack. And so, the way the Spirit operates would be to, that's where the trust comes in, to be open to to miracles, to experiences that would give you uh, a sense of joy and a sense of intrinsic joy and happiness 
um, that really comes from just following what's, what's given. And the ego will try to jump in there and say, you don't know what's given. You, you're not hearing, you know, you're blocked in some way, and it puts the, that puts a pressure on as well, because then you can fall back into like self-help, uh, self-improvement courses, and you spend money on them, and then if they don't bring the desired outcome, then the ego rams in there again. Well, you've wasted your time and wasted your money. So it's, it's always trying to reinforce the lack and reinforce the inadequacy using the symbols of the world. And I think your question is, is a question that relates to, to all of us because we, I think it's a very common pattern that you're describing. It's not like it's not like it's an extremely rare case. This is a very, very common pattern. This whole world is a projection of of the belief in lack. Scarcity among friendships, scarcity among resources, money, mobility, you know, in many ways, um, this is Time and space is set up like a Venus flytrap, or like it's, it's set up like a big trap to try to, a spider web to catch you. And, and it takes a lot of introspection and really looking closely at, at what these beliefs are, because they, they're very deeply rooted in the mind. They do usually persist through childhood and all the way into adulthood for many people. Address that. Yeah, yeah. I have a little memory. Um, 20, 23 years ago, 23 years ago, um, Alexander and I moved to Maui, believe it or not. Um, I couldn't work at all because I just had this calling in my heart. I felt so strong um, that I, I was being called in such a deep way that anything that I thought of doing felt like a total betrayal to that calling in my heart. Um, and I, I, I remember sitting in my room for the better part of three or four months just praying. Alexandra did not luckily feel that. And she was, you know, in some way I feel she was being used in a different way at that time. But she was bringing in a little bit of money for us at that time. And it seemed it was all spirit's play. But I just burned in that for those months until finally something came in, and what came in was actually I was introduced to a woman, I became a nanny <laughs> for a, a, a little one-year-old baby, um, one and two-year-old baby, and I did that for about a year. We did that together for about a year, and um, and there are certain things that I feel, you know, we're, we're just, when we stay true to that calling in our heart, that there's something that will happen in our circumstances that will blast you out of that isolation. And the prayer, will, your prayer will combust. You know, it's like spontaneous combustion. <laughs> spontaneous combustion. You know? Something just happens where you just, and some, then think one thing will lead to another. But there is, there is a need to, to really, I think, just honor that part of you that just is, is in that prayer. Um, so, so deeply in that prayer of like, please show me. What, what my next step is, this is really all I care about is you have my life. I, I belong to you. I'm owned by you. In you, no harm can come to me. You show me the way. And then things open up. And even now, uh, I'm in the healing arts and I, I work with touch and, um, you know, like a spiritual coaching type of thing or psychotherapy. And even I'm, I'm questioning that now. I'm like, is this my highest calling? And, Spirit will show me a miracle that will happen. Okay, well, I can still use this. Great, but I'm not limiting my expression to that anymore. I'm like, okay, I, I'm really just wanting to be, you know, there's that quote you always use, David. You know, um, use me up. Keep on using me until you use me up. And, and that's really the, the people I'm attracting into my life. Those are the, the people who have that prayer. And, you know, you're attracting them into your life, too. Just use me up. I, I really want to be used up. I don't want to be little anymore. I don't want to be play little anymore. So, yeah, that's some of the thoughts that come to me way with that show. I just want to add to 
too, that uh, life is pretty fast and the shifts and changes in form come quite rapidly. And uh, we've moved quite a bit recently to different places and from one location to the next, we haven't really known where we're going or what we're doing. And sometimes it's just been quite last minute in terms of what the plan is. And uh, that's really been so helpful for me. Um, what's been, the shift that's been happening is that um, I know that I'm not in charge. And it's just such a relief. And when these shifts come, I, I feel a lot of fear. But the mind training that's happened is that I don't, I, I don't try to fix it in my mind. Um, there's a stop, somehow, miraculously, there's a stopping of that. I'm just, I just don't, my mind gets very quiet now when things change and I see that it's not me that's doing the decisions. Just to be really quiet and still. And there can be a tremendous amount of fear. Like we were recently over the summer, I had the privilege of being out in Utah with Living Miracles and we had so much fun and so much uh, love and generosity. And our hearts really opened. And it was actually hard for us to leave, but Spirit was calling us out, and, and we didn't even know where we were going. We were literally driving from, from Salt Lake City to West, but we really didn't know where we were. And, and it's true, true. Yeah. But the, you know, what happened in the last five months has been so miraculous. We've had the nicest places to stay and met the most beautiful people, and it's all been about, I'll just say it in my, how I feel, it's been Alexandra thawing out, <laughs> like the ice block of my heart, just melting, and being willing for this river of love to flow through, and to really put aside everything that I've learned, and everything I know, and just really feel that I'm not alone, and that I don't need to know anything. It's just really clueless. <laughs> it's really, you know, David uses that word a lot, and it's so clueless. Like Brian and I look at each other about trying to like know a little bit, but we don't. <laughs> and, like just both of us are totally clueless together. Oh my God! It's like it's 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 babyhood. You know, we're we're totally dependent on love, and yet. The more we open to that in our hearts, the more we feel that there's space to, to just feel the spirit that's with us and the love. And we're doing that with every conflict. And, and what I'll say is that we can kind of expect fear to come up more because there's space for it. And we're welcoming it. And it's scary, but it's, it's really living, really alive. <laughs> So much gratitude. Yeah. I think too, when I hear you talk, Sean, it's like, yeah, it's like that's, we're all going through those stages of development of trust. And it's, we just go at the pace we can go at with, with the readiness that we have to open, to build our confidence and our trust in this very different way, which is highly intuitive, 100% intuitive. And, uh, you know, I know you've been a course student for years. I, I went and had lunch with uh, Judy Scutch yesterday, and, and she was telling me that when she moved into this place where they are now, um, her and her husband at the time, Whit was still living, you know, they, they started to get to feel like something was up, and then they heard that there was going to be tearing down the house next to them and construction for two years, and <laughs> they're like, oh, you know, 86 and 90 years old, still fully active with their minds, um, and yet they're being flushed out of this place where they are. And so there was a real estate agent they knew, and, and she kind of called him up, called Judy up and said, you know, I think maybe 
you maybe need my services. I mean, we need to show you something, and she was like, that's very intuitive, and you would just call out of the blue, and yes, we do. Uh, yeah, there's the house next to us is being torn down, and, and then, well, I think there's a place here, it's really good, and it's a rental, and you might be able to afford it. Well, that's good that it's a rental, because, yeah, we, you know, we can't afford to buy it, and then they went through the whole process, and it turns out it's the top-rated uh, kind of a community for for elderly in the whole state of, uh, of California. And I was saying to her, well, Jesus is really watching over you. And she, and they got there and they looked at it though, and they said, no, it's, it, it's not, they said, we will only give you a one year lease. And Judy, the publisher, of course, she was like 86 and her husband's nine. A one year lease? You know, were you, you know how old we are? You want to give us a one year lease and then what? We're out, and so no, that's no. We can't, we can't do a one-year lease. And then they said, "Well, you could, could you buy it?" And they're like, "Well, no, we, I don't think we can afford to buy it or anything. So make an offer." So they they give this real low-ball offer, like you know how real estate is, like a fifty percent, like a half half off offer on the the place and everything, and, and the guy was like, mm, I, I just, I, no, I don't think we can take that. Uh, and then the realtor starts saying, these people are so loving, and they're so uh, helpful to, to the human race. What do you mean they're helpful to the human race? Well, they're, they run a non-profit. What kind of non-profit? It's, uh, it's for training your mind and uh, what, how, what do you mean, training your mind? You know, if this guy, a 50% offer, <laughs> that's like he wants to know, give me something like that. And finally he's like, well, they, they use the, their publishers, their publishers, their book publishers. What books do they publish? Only one book. <laughs> one book. They publish one book, yes. The book, what's the book? What's the book? It's A Course in Miracles. And then the guy's like, that book saved my life oh, in 1984. My you got it. Also, <laughs> it sold him the property. We're about to have fun. And then she's still there. We're, we're there having lunch and she's telling the story. But there they are at 86. And to me, that was just another development of trust wow. story, you know. Where you get a little hunch, you get a little nudge. Of course the ego is going to come in with all of its yak 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 stuff, but as we learn to be intuitive, we follow those nudges, those little hunches. And, and I can't tell you in, in the parable of David how many times that has happened. It just happens over and over and over and over. It happens so much that, that you start to get accustomed to the idea that miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. You know, talk about flipping things around, but that's how the, the lack is undone. And that's a good reminder that there, even for Judy, she was still full of appreciation, and it was still one of those trust builders, the way she lives her life. And that's what we're all doing with our lives. We're really giving it over and, and letting go of control, and little by little getting more trusting and more clueless. <laughs> yes. Yes, go ahead. You may need to be switched on.
and Mr. Is it Tedford? Bill Tedford. Mm -hmm. Bill Tedford came in that morning, <laughs> and I said to him, and I heard who he was, and I said, "Oh, I just finished reading the course this morning," and he he said to me. Well, that just means you start again tomorrow. <laughs> wise, very wise. <laughs> it was like 1990 year, I think it was. It had been on path. Um, and recently I have been um, studying Ernest Holmes at the Center for Spiritual Living. And a lot of what you've said today was like, you know, about thought and mind, and it's like, it, it's, I did not know that I was gonna want to know more about how you see things, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm drawn to it, and I, I feel like I need to. <laughs> but somehow, um, we um, stopped at your place Spent the evening at your place in Mexico watching a movie. What was the name of it? <laughs> it was, and it, it was a time when you were gone. It was fascinating to see this room full of people, who very, very involved in what was going on, and um, and people talking about taking leaps. And it sounded kind of dangerous to me. <laughs> 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 I, I'm, I'm kind of a gradualist. You know. <laughs> but, but I'm getting old, and it feels like <laughs> wait a few more decades. <laughs> trampoline or a springboard. It, it, it 
doesn't want you to just forever cling to the words and to the concepts. You know, he'll say this, this course is a beginning and not an end. Uh, and, and it's always pointing towards our inner guidance and intuition. It's not trying to make us dependent on a book. Uh, in fact, I love books and tools that, that actually tell you to forget them. This one, instead of saying, this is the only way to God, and you, you'll need this to get to God, it's like, forget this world, forget this course, it says in Lesson 189. I said, how cool, a tool that says, forget me. Uh, I like that, because I, I think it, it does come down to that sense of, of experience. And when you said you're more of a gradualist, you know, that's actually, for most people, most people do have a very slowly evolving curriculum of awakening. So it's, just to relax and know that's, that's the norm. Uh, there are, you know, in our community there have been those that seem to take a lot of leaps, like a, a community of leapers, but, but not, with, not out of a, a blind sense, like they, they'll sit and talk to people and maybe have an inkling already in their heart, and then they'll get paired up with somebody to talk to who's actually been in a very similar situation and, and took what seemed to be a leap of faith, but actually they say, oh, it wasn't so bad at all, and actually I feel, I did it, and I feel so much better, and it, we have to have safety in this journey. You have to have a feeling of safety. And so, if there's a certain element of risk seen with things, then I think you just go along right where your readiness is. And I've met so many people with the Course all over the world, but I always hear these readiness parables. They'll tell me, you know, I got it in the house, and then stayed there on the bookshelf for like four years, and then they tell me where it moved next in the house, and I'm, I'm like, Cool, and this is a slowly evolving, you see how gentle spirit is, you know. And then I, I, oh, I used to do a plant stand for a couple of years, and then it got put into a, a box in my attic. And then, then when my partner left me, I was in crisis, and then I opened this dusty book, and oh my gosh, you know, you see how it's, it's a readiness story. But when you hear bunches and bunches of those all over the world, then it starts to be more like a symphony of, oh, we really have to be ready. The Spirit's not going to force anything on us, and not going to coerce us, and we have to, we have to reach a certain, almost like disillusionment or dissatisfaction with what we're experiencing before we have an impetus, you know, to move in some direction. So, I think it's, that's your, what you're bringing up is very connected to what Sean was bringing up there. We have to take it easy on ourselves and be gentle and not try to hold ourselves to some kind of external standard when, you know, we can't go any faster than, than, than we can go. You know, we, we just have to, we have to be intuitive that way. So thank you for bringing that up for everybody to remind us. And is the new unedited Course in Miracles book something good to read, or do you know? <laughs> is there opinion? Is that just an opinion? Or? Well, I have found in working with the Course since 1986, and now there's, I think there's, what is there, six or how many editions? Yeah. Five, five, five or six, six. editions. I, I find it all kind of funny, because I'm like, you know, the core, the gist of the principles, whether it's this thick or this thick, the gist of the principles is the same. You know, the, the bigger ones offer some more examples and, and some more details, but I have often found that, that getting a gist of the principles, whether you do it through the Course, or Religious Science, Ernest Holmes, or you know, the core of those principles, it, it really comes down more to the practical application. So, it would be almost like if you had a set of 
all these like six or six different steak knives and they're all sharp and you're sitting there going, I just can't decide which <laughs> steak knife I'm going to use and, and the spirit's like, cut the damn steak. <laughs> you, know, you know, that I kind of feel like for, for most Course in Miracles students, if Jesus appeared to them in their living room, he would say, can we not focus on practical application? Because we're so always looking to the form, you know. Do I have the right version? You know, is it the, is it the, and, and the principles really are, the workbook is in, in all of them, and, and the core principles are, are the same. So, I don't really put too much faith in, uh, in different uh, editions or anything. I used the original one and got happy, and then, you know, now I just, I just want to have it. It's fun to take leap of faith. Because <laughs> that's what apparently I have done. And, <laughs> and um, lately we are on this tour. Um, we're on David's book tour. <laughs> we're talking about David's book, which we have um, collaborated on with David for two and a half years. The clones are loose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we are clones. <laughs> But we, um, we were guided to set up some gatherings in LA, in LA, and, um, and it was odd because we were apparently guided to go there, but you know, it's expensive to go and stay there in a hotel or whatever, and we didn't have a place, we didn't have a hotel, we didn't want to book a hotel, and we didn't have a host. Normally we have somebody that says, can you come and we'll host you, and then we set up the gathering. But we had the gatherings coming first, the, the, the talks, and nowhere to stay. And then all of a sudden this woman, who I never talked to before, she wrote me an email. Uh, Can we talk? And I said, sure. And she said, yeah, I live in, um, in California. And, and, um, and blah, blah, blah. We talked. And, I had a counseling call with her, and, and I said, yeah, we're going to LA and we're going to hold some gatherings. And she's like, do you have a place to stay? Uh, <laughs> no, we don't. Well, why don't you just stay in our apartment? And she's not staying in the, in the apartment. Um, she's living somewhere else. Wow. It's this beautiful, magnificent apartment in central LA. Wow. And she gave it to us, and she's like, you can stay as long as you want. Yeah. Wow. So we stayed there for like two weeks and more <laughs> gatherings came in and yeah, it was, it's really fun to take leaps of faith, but it, it is unsettling because before we got the apartment we were like, at least I was thinking, are we really going to go there? Is it really guided and you know, all those doubts, but to just stay and stay in trust and then and we have the next leap of faith coming because we set up a retreat in Miami, which is another expensive place. And, and nobody has signed up so far. <laughs> as far as I know. So, uh, so we are on a Facebook Live. So we'll see if somebody feels called, we're going to have a wonderful retreat in Miami, a weekend. Uh, that will be very, very deep and intimate where we just come together in a very relaxed way and we're there only for this purpose of you know looking at the mind together and uh, yeah anything can happen and healing always happens so that's coming up the last weekend of March. Which, um we haven't mentioned this yet either, but uh, there are books for sale. Uh, the new book, it's just been out for a month. It's called This Moment is Your Miracle, and it's a practical application book. So all these principles that we're speaking about um, are in there. The metaphysics are in there. It's uh, easy to read. It's 200 pages, and it's, uh, yeah, it has exercises for you to kind of go through and uh, undo some of these uh, self-concepts and beliefs that uh, hold us back. So. And it's channeled material from David's 
mannen <laughs> from the Holy Spirit <laughs> through David. And, uh, he didn't sit down to write it. He spoke it, and others wrote it down, and we uh, compiled it and edited it down. So it's a very, very practical, wonderful book we get. I don't think anybody's told us they didn't like it yet. Everybody said they like it, and it's wonderful. It's helpful. It's wonderful. <laughs> and this topic too of, of leaps of faith, did, does anyone remember that was the Raiders of the Lost Ark and Harrison Ford when he comes to the big um, gully pit, he's got to go across it and, uh, and his, he's given the message, you know, you have to take a leap of faith. And, but the way it looks to his eyes is that it's just a drop off. And he can't see that there's this walkway across, and he has to literally put his foot and his leg out and take the first step to his perception as if he's going to step off this cliff and go down. And then you can see that his foot comes down and it lands on something solid. And then the way Spielberg shot it, you know, he takes that step, then he takes more steps, walks all the way across, and then the camera pivots around to another angle where you can actually see that there's, there's a pathway mm -hmm. from a different angle. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I've, I've shown that clip many, many times all around the world because it's from the perspective of, of fear and doubt, it can be, seem at times like we're just dropping off into nothing. We're stepping where there's no solid ground, there's nothing there. And then from another perspective, you can see that, oh, it's there all right. And when he goes across, he actually throws some stones across so that whoever comes next can actually see the stones, can actually see that there is a pathway there. Which is quite similar to the way the way showers on the spiritual journey. They, they go deeper into the mind, they go deeper into toward the light, and then they, they leave the breadcrumbs. And so you might say that books like uh, the great scriptures of the world, or A Course in Miracles, you know, are, are a lot of breadcrumbs uh, for us to, to look at, and to, to read, and to study, and then to give them a try, like try them out. So, yeah, it's cool. So we're, yeah, we, we do say, be willing to take the leap of faith, and then with a lot of the, the travels, there's just been so many parables of uh, places showing up. People offering, oh come and stay with me, and what do you need? Uh, can I put a tank of gas in your car? Can I offer this and that? I know for myself, I was raised with a Protestant work ethic, so yeah, I had all kinds of ways that I felt like money could come in, very particularly, and, and what was acceptable, and then once I got out on the road, I had to start to trust and let things be provided that were very helpful, but went against the conditioning. And the biggest problem I had at the beginning when I was doing this was I would, I would turn down things that were offered to me. People would say, you know, come and stay with me, or I here can take this, here's some money, and I'd, oh, no, I couldn't. Oh, no, I, no, I couldn't. <laughs> ah, no, I can't do that. And, and finally Jesus was like, would you stop that? <laughs> and that's me giving things to you. I told you, if you do a miracle worker for me, I would provide for you, and then you're saying no to everything, you know. And so, uh, like that story about the, the guy with the helicopter that comes, and it was the same thing. Uh, you know, we have this old conditioning, and we have to just open our minds up, and, and all of us have had lots and lots and lots of those kind of experiences. That's how we build the confidence, where things show up and we go, Wow, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> and I, we land at the airport in Oakland, and we're in there, and Sundari's, uh, we're trying to get out of the parking lot, and she's got a car, and you were trying to pay, and, and everything, and then I was just watching the gate. You know, she's like, we're coming to the car, and, and this and this, and I'm, I'm, saying, I'm over there, I'm going, open sesame, <laughs> open sesame, and she's doing the car, and then, and then she's still, and I'm going, look! <laughs> up comes the gate, she goes, hey! <laughs> she's 
she's like, I don't know about the car now, but the gate opened. And then we, we had another one. We were out again, we were at Judy's. And then we were, we were walking, we, we drove over towards this place, the, with, with the gate down, we didn't know and everything. And, and so I'm like, in my mind, I'm going, open sesame, open sesame. And she pulled up, the, the gate came right up again. So we were like shooting through under gates and everything, but it was, we were laughing all the way. Uh, and I've had that happen a lot too, where one time I was in San Francisco and my uh, friend Lorraine, she w sees herself as like a, a mega manifester, and then she sees me in the car with her. She goes, us together we can manifest anything. I'm already a mega manifester. They, you in the car. Wow. So she let's try it out. So Golden Gate Bridge. She's like, we're just heading to the Golden Gate Bridge, and she's like, parking space. Parking space, there it is! <laughs> and so we had a hilarious day of just going around down on Market Street and Fisherman's Wharf, all these places. Parking space, she'd go, parking space, and then we'd go there. Not that we were, I wasn't trying to make it. I wasn't trying to turn water into wine or do anything like this, but it's just in the joy, anything that is a reflection of your joy which is getting like seven parking spaces in a row. Uh, she just had so much fun. And I just love being with her in the car and hearing her bellowing laughter as her, her husband was just like, just shaking his head like, oh gosh, I'm like looking at me like, don't encourage her. Oh my God, I can live with this every day now. I'll never be able to live with it. But. Dennis, you had a question. Yeah, the question I had was, Triggered by Emily's family, Jenny's <laughs> comment of, is that really guidance? Because that's the biggest struggle that I've been having. And so much of the time I get frustrated because I've already answered the question that I have. <clears throat> and the frustration is also, because I get confused, not clear, And, and so I, I just kind of dismiss it because I'm getting confused and saying, okay, this, this can't be guidance because I'm all confused about it. And uh, so I just let it go <clears throat> as much as I can let it go and it, and it goes. So I think the primary thing is the question is, the feeling level is primary. And I know when I'm in, when I'm in spirit and I'm feeling that, then I know what the guidance is, and, I just, and it comes, and it's natural. <clears throat> but oftentimes when I'm asking a question, I'm in my head, and I'm not in that feeling level. So that's where I get confused, I get scatterbrained with it, and I have to ask that question, so what's guidance here? So that's, that's pretty much it, I mean, <clears throat> and I just need some clarity around that so that I can follow guidance better. Yeah, I think I would say that, like even the title of the book, This Moment is Your Miracle, that guidance is in the now. And to the extent we even take a beautiful topic like guidance and we, we put it on the timeline, we, we like smatter it down on the timeline, then it gets complicated. Um, it gets confusing, it gets into analysis. Uh, that's that analytical part. Is this guided? Really, is this guided? How do I feel? But look at that outcome, you know, and it starts to, to get, uh, it gets away from the, that deep inner feeling that you're talking about, you know, where you, you come back to that. So, I would say too, it's, it's very much similar to prayer, that, that when you pray, um, the, the less specific that you can be, or a better way of saying it is the less parameters and conditions that you put on your prayer, the better the, the prayer. Uh, Spirit, Holy Spirit, Jesus, intuition, they'll work with the mind with whatever you feel to do. But uh, Jesus worked very specifically with the scribe of A Course in Miracles, Helen Sheckman, 
And, and specifically around prayer, he would, he would say, well, to the extent that you can take the parameters off, the conditions off the prayer, the prayer can be more effective. For example, the, you know, she liked green pantyhose. She was in New York City and she liked her green pantyhose, so she would say, I'll scribe this course for you, Jesus, but I want my green pantyhose. And he would tell her where to go in New York City to get the green pantyhose to save time so she could get back to the, the scribing. She wanted a winter coat. It had to be a Borgana winter coat and she would only pay a certain amount of money, not full price. So a used Borgana coat in this price range and Jesus would take her right to the store where she could get the Borgana coat for that price range. Because why? Not because Jesus is into green pantyhose and Borgana coats. He's, he's trying to save time. Because it's, it's going to take seven years to get this Course of Miracles in this realm. And uh, let's get the pantyhose thing and the Borgana coat out of the way. And, but he did use it to say, the, the more you can take the parameters off the prayer, like, what's the best, can, where's the best coat for me? You know, Jesus is like, that will save some time, you know. Like, leave it to me to pick the best coat for you, with the less parameters. And so, that's where the judgments come in. Parameters, preferences, you know, when we get really particular, and we wonder why we have trouble hearing the guidance, is because we, we complicate. It's just a heaven. We complicate things. Uh, we don't know how to ask real simple, direct questions, because our ego is already complicating things. So I would just keep that in mind, as you're even looking for guidance. Start off, practice with little, simple, straightforward things, and build your confidence, you know, so you get that kind of confirmation feeling, like, oh yes, that, that, that was my guidance. And then slowly, almost like a little toddler, who's just taking their first steps, you know, we don't want them running a marathon uh, at the beginning. We want them to be, it's okay to fall, I'll pick you up, I'll encourage you, I'll nurture you, because I want you to, to learn how to walk. And it's the same, I think, with guidance and prayer. We just have to, to keep it simple and, and have some successes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to stay open too, I, I feel before we have, like, I, I was inspired to uh, introduce you to the Open Circle and Jenny and Greg to Open Circle. And then from that, I had no idea I was going to be stepping into such a role. <laughs> you know, but then. Inspiration. Yeah, the, inter <laughs> the inspiration comes, like, if you have an inspiration. And then there may be a lot of other elements that come to ask you to do things that. that that you didn't pray for, you know, that are just that something is open to invite you to keep listening and following that that thread. Yeah. I have a present day Organa code um, example. I don't know if we have time, but if we do, do we have a minute? A share? Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we were driving up here from LA. Central California, the other just two, two, three days ago. And, you know, I have those thoughts because I'm from the country and, and um, don't feel like, you know, I look like a San Francisco girl or whatever. Everybody is waxing their skin. And, and, I, <laughs> and I've never done that actually. And everybody's saying, you're blonde, you don't have to. But, I thought I probably need to do that to, to get go here. So we stopped <laughs> on the road, and and I said to Greg, I do want to, you know, remove some hair from my face, and uh, and I said so I've never done. That. I don't really know where to go, you know, for those <laughs> things. Uh, so we stopped in some kind of mall that was by the highway, and immediately where we parked, I see there is a sign. Like, waxing or f facial treatment or whatever. And I just walk in and I say, I, I want to just do something with my eyebrows. And, and there was a little Chinese woman and she's like, you, um, 
come here, come in the back, I'm going to, what, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to wax your face, so lay down. <laughs> and she told me what she was going to do. <laughs> so it was so perfect, and it was done like in 15, 20 minutes, great. God is great. Yeah, I love her, and she spoke to me, she asked so many questions, she was so fascinated. <laughs> Are you married to an American? She was. <laughs> 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 so she was Swedish. And yeah, she got more and more fascinated, and she was the one saying thank you, thank you to me afterwards. <laughs> The waxing miracle. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Okay, anybody else? I have something if you guys have time. Hmm? Yeah, we'll, we'll try to squeeze real quickly here. These two. I'll keep it short. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier about you know how uh, hearing is coming from the mind rather than you know sounds coming from outer into the inner. And it made me realize something. Um, I had an experience with my dad. Um, I, we went to the doctor's appointment together. This was last year. And he was really sick. He's been sick for a long time. He's really underweight. And um, so we're sitting in the waiting room. And he's like, yeah, I've been sick for a year. And he's like, I think I'm ready to go. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I've, I've lived a long life. And I'm ready. He's like in his 80s. And it was interesting because my, I was expecting my reaction would be like, oh no, dad, don't say that. But I was like, you know, I'm going to be present with this man. Yeah, so I was really um, being present with him and really connect with him. Um, and I really saw his innocence. <laughs> it's like in that moment, he was so pure. Like, he was so beautiful. <laughs> it's that like I've never seen him that way. <laughs> and um, and he continued to say, yeah, I'm gonna go. And I felt this sense of peace and joy. And um, I was really present with it to, to the point where I, we kind of disappeared, like he and I. <laughs> and, um, and also he has a hearing problem, like major. Like, he can't hear anything. And in that moment, everything I said, he heard me. And I didn't have to project my voice. I didn't have to scream. <laughs> he heard everything. It was like, oh, wow. And what you said earlier about coming from inside, he really um, responded to love. Like, the purity and the love. So it's beautiful. But because we have a very volatile past, because this is a man who was physically abusive and violent growing up with him. You know, I was like subject to beatings chronically. And, um, but in that moment, all of that was gone. <coughs> so it was like so beautiful. Like our relationship is transformed. Like, you know, he sees me now. He, you know, he used to um, complain to my mom about the kids. Like, Oh, so and so, like, I can't stand that. And she's like, I don't know what you did, but he never speaks ill of you anymore. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard anything mm -hmm. negative. Mm -hmm. oh, so. It's beautiful, the power, the power of the healing and the miracle. That's amazing. Yeah. And then yeah, to but, think you can radiate that to all aspects, like you get a strong sense of it, then, okay, I can do this. I can let this expand to everything. Yeah, that's that's what it's all about. Yeah, and I didn't do anything. You know, we talk about like uh, I didn't do nothing, and uh, and today I was driving and I was realizing, oh wow, I'm being guided to be in the state of active inaction because I'm so like an active person. I feel like oh my my love language is act of service. So my whole life is like, what's next? How can I serve next? <laughs> and now they're like, they're, I'm here and no, you don't do anything right now. Be present. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I, I thought I was going to drive David tomorrow and he's like, 
oh yeah, so Dara's gonna draw. I'm like, oh my god, this is like being done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would love to draw it, but I don't have to. <laughs> and I still, like, my sense of worth is not derived from my service. Like, none of it. I just wanted to say out loud to you know, everyone here <laughs> that I've just been really scared and freaked out and yeah, I don't I wouldn't speak. And um um uh I've, I've just had moments of the last few months like just being so uncomfortable and feeling like I this is I'm not where I'm supposed to be, this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing on a and it's like almost painful, or pain is painful. And um, and I got back to California to, and been working for a friend out in the country, and it's just been getting really awful. <laughs> like this is horrible. And then, and but I've been panicked. Like where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And then, and I haven't had like it's just been exhausting me, and I've been frustrated with myself. Like I don't. I can't keep with my studies, and but I keep it with me all day in my head. And just recently, I've been able to like, this is my dream figures. This is my dream. This is my nightmare, and I I chose this. I can choose something else. And I just and I know it's not the stuff, but I felt so trapped and so um, um, and I felt so bad. <laughs> it's just really awful, and I. I don't know what I'm going to do now. I don't care. I, I, I'm amazed at how unpanicked I feel. I'm shocked. It's like shocking. Like, I, I feel pretty damn good. I'm just like, <laughs> you know, so I'm like, wow. It's so not me because I'm so someone who, like, I'm always taking care of business and no, no one else can take care of me. I'm taking care of myself. And... And, and I will get taken care of somehow, I know, but I'm always got a plan, and that's how I am, and, and I'm panicked if I don't, you know, and I just, and um, I thought, it's okay to walk away from something that feels horrible. I don't have to do this to myself, so, and I just wanted to share that. So I, I feel, yeah, like, it's just, wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Well, I think that's the perfect way to close because yeah. that, yeah. that's our sense of trust and, and not having to know everything. It, it's been a theme. Brian talked about it, Tia was just talking, and then you, it's like it's coming full circle into things aren't working out. We love that growing up too when somebody would tell us, it's all going to work out. <laughs> we love those words. We didn't care who said it. So it was just like, it's good. Just, just feel the good, goodness of it. So, well, I think we've come to the end of our time here. And, and thank you for the invitation to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a blessing. God bless you all. Love Coming. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We do have a, a Petaluma event tomorrow. Um, if you feel called or interested in any way, um, we've got little flyers <coughs> up on the table. It's from 2 to 6 p.m. and it will be beautiful. Jamie and Greg are going to really take us a lot deeper with the book. Um, and we've been using the book, the exercises at the end of each chapter, so we'll get an experience that we'll share together um, with the application. And, and really the joining is, is where it's at. And we've been doing this, and just even Brian and I together going through the exercises. So for those of you who got a book, find someone and join with them and do the exercises because it really lights you up and really brings the clarity. And after Petaluma tomorrow, um, we'll, starting Wednesday, next Wednesday uh, and Friday and Saturday, we'll be in Ashland with Jamie and Greg again. And if you'll
feel free to drive over to Ashland and join in. That's not that far. Six hours up the road. If you feel inspired, I know we have some people that are really inspired to come, like Dennis and Kathy and Mita and Donna, maybe. Um, so, yeah, feel free. Please come. Um, you know, let's let's go deeper.